So it's great, great pleasure that CCVO has been hosting the HR Hundred Box series with, with the talent pool. Today's session is on competencies, critical skills, and transferability, and it is the last of our series. Well, maybe not. Um, but I'll let Nicole have the thunder on that one. <laughs> um, I would like to take a moment to introduce you to my partner in crime, Nicole Jelly, who is the executive director of the talent pool. So uh, thank you very much for being here today. Uh, you know what? This is fantastic. We've got a room filled to capacity, and I believe 20 waiting listees over 20 waiting listees. So uh, obviously we hit a nerve with this topic and particularly with everything that's going on right now in the economy. So don't be surprised if all of a sudden there is another session on this particular topic because uh, I don't know how we're going to evolve from an economic perspective without this knowledge. So today, we've got a really jam-packed, full of information session with experts that really understand what competencies, critical skills, and most importantly, transferability is all about. So to my left, Jeff Griffiths. Principal with Griffiths Shepherd Consulting Group. And Jeff and I came across each other when we did a session at the talent pool precisely on the topic of competency. What was it, last spring 2015? June? June. And it, that's when I realized we were onto something. We had 65 guests and we had to turn away people. So Jeff is going to talk to us at the very high level what really do, do competencies mean because it is not something that we really utilize in Canada yet to the degree of other countries. So stay tuned for his session. So I've got my notes and I may even follow them. And you're up. And I'm up. Woohoo! Emotion. It's good when things work. Um, especially this early in the morning. Um, yeah, I, I just, uh, I, I flew in uh, last night by a bit of a roundabout route from, uh, actually from Ottawa, which was fun. They don't fly directly to Calgary from Ottawa anymore. Apparently no one in Ottawa wants to come to Calgary these days. <laughs> um, so anyway. So thanks, thanks for all for coming. Um, I, uh, I'm a management consultant and I guess what you would call a, a competency advocate. Uh, there we go. Um, which honestly isn't something that I thought that uh, needed advocating for, um, but apparently it does. So I'll advocate for it. Um, what I'm going to do is, uh, I, I'm sort of the warm-up act or the, uh, the warm-up band. Um, I'm going to do a really high-level overview of some of this stuff uh, and uh, look at it, uh, not only uh, some concepts around it, look at why it's important, uh, how it can be applied within, uh, within the nonprofit sector, uh, and then also how this is important in terms of serving your clientele. Um, the idea is to set the table for the, uh, for the main uh, band that's uh, coming behind me uh, and warm you up to uh, the concepts that they're going to be talking about. Um, there'll be time at the end for questions, but if I say something that uh, really annoys you uh, during this or you have some burning issue that you just got to get off your chest, if it can't wait till the end, then... Uh, fire away and I'll do my best to answer it. Um, if it can wait to the end, there, are, there is a Q&A session at the end of this thing. Um, anybody have any burning questions right now? Good. So first off, one of the problems we have with this is uh, if you put a half a dozen 
consultants or people who work in this competency field together in a room and ask them what they mean when they talk about competency and competencies, you'll probably, out of a half dozen of us, you'll probably get a dozen different answers. Um, it's, there's, the, the language around this seems to be evolving, and it's a bit of a moving target. Um, when I talk about competencies and competency uh, and skills, uh, I fall back on the definitions uh, that derive from the uh, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. Um, so they talk about skill being very task-oriented, very, uh, very specific in a, in a very narrow context. They talk about competence being uh, your ability to take that skill and apply it across multiple domains and, uh, and in situations that you may or may not have ever seen before. And competencies, as they define it, are uh, traits and characteristics that enable the application of your technical skills. We'll get into that in, in a little bit more in, in a minute. Um, I'd love to show you how all of this neat stuff fits into Canada's skills, qualifications, and competencies framework. Except, as Nicole mentioned, I can't because we don't have one. Um, we are, yeah, there's, there's our skills and competencies framework right there. Um, we are one of the only countries in the OECD that doesn't have one of these. And uh, that's unfortunate um, because, frankly, competency, uh, as we describe it, and competencies are the stuff that employers actually pay for. Uh, I was at the, uh, the CERIC Career Managers Conference yesterday in, in Ottawa, presenting, oddly enough, on competency. And uh, we did a little experiment in the room. I had about 100 people in the room, and they were from, some of them were uh, career counselors, some of them were from the post-secondary, some of them were from government uh, and other things. And we asked them, you know, name your top three or four competencies that allow you to be successful in your job. And interestingly enough, none of them came up with anything that looked like a technical skill. They were all higher level teamwork skills, planning skills, critical thinking skills, uh, communication skills, collaboration skills. And although they all came from different domains, they all identified the same critical competencies. And none of it had anything to do with what they learned in school which was interesting. Okay. When we look at this, these building blocks of performance, right? We've been noodling around in this world in Canada for a long time. We got, uh, actually, uh, 10 or 15 years ago, Canada was kind of ahead of the curve on this stuff with the uh, Essential Skills Program. And, you know, we have uh, these nine essential skills. The ones on the left are the ones that we actually measure because they're things that you can measure. Uh, and so when you see ES profiles for jobs and things like that, they tend to be related to, uh, you know, the read and write and arithmetic stuff. The uh, right side, which are, are, are critical, and in fact, the right side skills are the ones that uh, my group yesterday all identified as being the most critical things for their job success. They're not the ones we can measure. We can observe them, we can, uh, we, we can contextualize them. Everybody recognizes when they're not there, but it's really hard to give someone a test in order to identify these things. This is one of the reasons why we don't because it's cumbersome and it doesn't fit within our paradigms of standardized testing. So we were onto this uh, a whole pile of years ago and um, the interesting thing about the essential skills is if you didn't work for HRSDC, now ESDC, or you weren't plugged in uh, into this world, this rarefied world that I live in, um, which is mind-numbingly boring most of the time, so you probably don't want to be in it. Um, if you didn't exist in that world, you probably never heard of it, and it never really got any traction in industry. Um, 
it, 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 at the fringes of industry, but it's, no, it's not really part of the conversation. The OECD uh, has been playing around with this as well, and uh, they've been talking about something they refer to as the uh, 21st century skills. I probably shouldn't walk in front of the screen. Uh, or the 21st century competencies. Is anybody familiar with this? 21st century competencies? It's getting a lot of traction. Um, OECD, I guess, has a bigger budget for marketing this stuff than uh, ESDC does for essential skills. But if you look at the, uh, the stuff that's on here, um, interestingly enough, this stuff basically corresponds to the elements on the right side of our essential skills profiles, the stuff we don't measure. It's kind of cool. That was one of my aha things late at night when I was reading this stuff. So these meta competencies, this stuff, is the, is the stuff that's actually uh, really, really critical for success. This is the building blocks of performance. This is the stuff that uh, employers pay for. And it's absolutely critical. Having these skills, these 21st century competencies, are what allows people to apply their technical skills to actually solve problems collaboratively and collectively. It's the secret sauce of performance. Anybody needs a copy of that slide, I'd be glad to send it to you. Okay. Because someone who has a technical skill but doesn't have the higher level meta competencies and can't apply those skills in multiple domains and on problems that they haven't seen yet isn't particularly useful when the world changes. And as we all know, the world is changing and it's constantly changing. And people that are working today are going to be required to deal with problems that we don't even know about yet. So the idea of creating a an adaptive and flexible workforce full of uh, critical thinkers and problem solvers is, is, is absolutely uh, an essential element for economic success for those individuals, for the organizations where they work, and ultimately for the entire economy. So these building blocks of performance, anybody who was at the session, I don't know if anybody was at the session back in June that I did for Talent Pool. Anyway, but I talked about you know, my kind of a Lego brick theory of, uh, of, of, uh, of jobs that says that every job is made up of these uh, building blocks of, uh, of, of skills and competencies, basic foundation uh, skills in reading, writing, uh, and then using those and applying them to the meta competencies and the higher order skills, and then acquiring the technical skills, okay? So, Based on all the research, based on everything we know, based on stuff that's been done in Canada and around the world, we know that the critical element for success, individually and organizationally, is this notion of talent and competence, and particularly these higher level meta competencies that no one teaches and that are difficult to assess. It's what employers pay for. It's what the economy runs on. So why does that matter? Particularly in your sector. Um, you know, and it's, it's interesting, because when we talk about the nonprofit sector, uh, you wander up the street a ways uh, to some of those big buildings, and we talk about nonprofit sector, and it's somehow there's this mistaken notion that life's easier in the nonprofit sector, that you don't need the level of skill that you need in other sectors, that yeah, everybody's laughing, right? <laughs> okay. It's not easier, and, and the reality is that the, the misconceptions that we have within our society about it just, frankly, just aren't true. I like to think of uh, the economy, uh, and I, I'll, I'll borrow this idea, actually, from, uh, from Peter Drucker, who you may have heard of. 
Uh, Drucker, the last part of his career, he's sort of uh, the, uh, the father of management consulting, so we all, we all like him. Uh, but he spent the latter 20 or 30 years of his career almost exclusively focused in the nonprofit and the NGO sector. Because he believed it was the one leg of this three-legged stool that supports the, uh, the economy of, of the nation that no one was paying enough attention to, and yet it was the one area where you could actually generate change was through the NGOs and the nonprofits. He saw it as a sector that required more competence, not less competence, more skill, not less skill. And in fact, uh, there's, a, there's a quote from his uh, Managing in a Time of Great Change, great book, um, where he says they should probably take all the money that, that they give to governments to try and do this stuff and just turn it all over to the nonprofit sector and the charities because they can actually do something with it, and they do. And they're far more efficient at doing it and far more effective at doing it than governments are. There's a lot of public sector programs he thought could be uh, and should be transferred over to the nonprofit sector. When these legs aren't equal, uh, the stool falls over, um, and your milk spills, which is unfortunate. So within your sector, this is a uh, ED of a nonprofit uh, during the budget meeting. Um, so the demands are really, really large. They're getting bigger, uh, and uh, I mean that's not going to change. There's factors causing this, as uh, you might have noticed. Um, Calgary's not quite the boom town that it was a couple years ago. Uh, corporate donations are down, uh, funding levels are down, the funders are, uh, are more concerned with uh, uh, specific project level funding now as opposed to the core funding and, uh, and funding overhead. It's harder to find volunteers. Am I telling you anything you don't know? <laughs> um, so even the volunteer world, and uh, as, as I've found out from, from talking to folks in, in the sector, it's harder to find volunteers. The ones that you do find want to be on fixed-term projects or specific project-oriented work as opposed to doing administrative and, and, and other things. No one's really interested in getting involved in fundraising, which is the one critical area that, uh, that the organizations need to deal with. No one wants to do administration, so you need staff to do that. You can't pay the staff to do that because your funding levels are down, and it's a vicious circle, and it just eats you right up. You're dealing with a finite... Uh, an often shrinking resource base, uh, and yet the demands on your sector are constantly increasing. The talent required to operate in that environment is, uh, it's unlike any other sector of the economy. Uh, the, the talent required is, in, uh, the talent levels required are increasing. And there's this demographics crunch coming because all the boomers like me are in the process of fading off into the distance, uh, a lot of the senior management of the NGO sector are folks my age or older. None of you, of course. Um, and uh, as they disappear from, from the workplace, replacing that uh, acquired talent is going to be very, very difficult. Um, it's not a career of choice necessarily for a lot of young folks. I was talking uh, with, uh, with Catherine uh, this morning, and uh, you know, folks are using the, uh, the nonprofit sector as a, as a career entry point in order to build some resume time so they can go and get a real job. Their words, not mine. Um, so it, it's tough. Managing those critical competencies are important, and those things are things like business acumen, which we never used to talk about much. In, in the nonprofit sector, but it's becoming increasingly important. Running the organization as a business with, uh, with, with customers, and you don't make profit, but you still have to generate revenues, you still have to provide services and, and, and generate value. Financial competency and financial literacy is, going, is, is huge in terms of, of, of competency now within the sector, uh, and it's getting bigger. Marketing and communications were always important, they're getting more important. What else? Any others? Critical skills that you just can't find for your, for your sector? Anybody? 
communication, written communication skills. Yeah. That's actually part of the marketing piece. Marketing for a, for a nonprofit or a, or, or a charitable organization is really about communication. Uh, presentation skills, verbal, written, uh, and, and whatever. Anything else? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the financial skills <clears throat> beyond bookkeeping, uh, financial management, financial planning skills are, 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 are huge and, and, again, becoming larger. And finding people with those talents uh, and using them appropriately is, 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 a, is harder. Figuring out what all those competencies that you need and then figuring out the right talent mix that's required both between paid staff and volunteers uh, is if it's not, it should be your one of your primary concerns as a as a leader in those organizations. I would suggest, actually, that it's one of the critical uh, should be the strategic critical piece for any organization because uh, managing talent is the only thing that matters for organizations. Because without that, nothing else can happen. Nothing else gets done. How many folks are familiar with the competency framework for the nonprofit and NGO sector? That's because there isn't one. That's why we're here. I actually, I looked, I hunted to try and find one. Uh, and, and I found all kinds of promises about them. I found all kinds of projects that had started and, and ended without creating one. I never did find a competency profile for the sector, which is interesting. Community Foundations has done some work in this area. Uh, they have a, uh, uh, they started down the road of creating a thing around individual competencies and eventually gave up and uh, created an organizational competencies matrix, which you may or may not know of. It's called Take Stock. Anybody ever heard of that? Uh, I'll, uh, I'll make sure there's a, a link to it. But there's actually an online questionnaire to uh, evaluate and, uh, and benchmark your organizational core competencies against this framework that, uh, that they've created. You have no idea how hard it was for me looking, specifically going to try and find it to find it, uh, and, and I had to get a hold of them so they could send me the link because I could not access it directly. I couldn't find it. I'd heard about it. It was rumored it was like a unicorn or Bigfoot or something, and I knew it was out there, and I actually had to go directly to that agency, ask them about another project that they had done, this individual competencies project that I couldn't find the reports on, find out they, they'd given up on it, and then they directed me to this other place. But I could not find that by doing a search. So, so anyway, if you're not uh, looking at this stuff, uh, if you, if you, if, uh, I'll, I'll post the, uh, the links, uh, or make sure everybody has, has access to the links for the take stock, because it's, it would be an interesting exercise to go through for your organization. Using this, you can get you a handle on the global competencies required, and then you can start working on your talent mix from that. My prediction is that organizations that don't take this competency seriously, whether they're in the nonprofit sector or any other area of activity, um, they're going to be squeezed out of the game. Because uh, as uh, certainly in your sector, the funders are, uh, are, are going to start demanding uh, results-based accounting. Uh, that requires competency, that requires talent, and if you, if you can't meet those new emerging requirements, and I don't want to steal some of Janet's stuff that's coming, but uh, you'll get squeezed. You're, gonna, you're, you're gonna, not going to be in the game anymore. So it's, it's critical to survival. So my next point is, uh, kind of gets into this idea of transferability, and I'll hurry up because I know I'm running out of time here. Where do you find competencies, assuming you've identified them at all, where do you get them? Where do you find your people now? Do a mirror test, anybody who wanders in is willing? 
They used to do that in the oil patch too. Dirk can talk about that. They don't do that anymore. <laughs> yeah, they don't do it in retail anymore either. So where do you find folks? Where do you, where do you go looking for the skills that you require in your organizations? Okay. So you, uh, what, job, job posting through ne and networking through, uh, through professional associations? <laughs> okay. What credentials do you need to work in the industry? Okay. Now I'm of the opinion that most credentials are meaningless anyway. That's my own personal opinion because there's such a variety of skills and competency within people who have a designation. And there's lots of designations, academic credentials, which don't necessarily lead you to believe that people can do the work in the first place, which is the whole idea of transferability. And I'll give you an example. I have an apprentice. I call him my apprentice. Um, He's a, a really bright guy. Uh, I mentored him at the UFC when he was doing his MBA. I now use him for project work. His wife graduated with a degree in, uh, in political science and went to work in sales uh, at an art gallery. Which is cool, she, and, and she actually has a, a real appreciation for fine art, so it worked real well. The gallery shut down, another victim of the downturn here, uh, and now she's working for one of the immigrant serving agencies here in Calgary as a program coordinator, using the skills that she acquired through her academic, through her involvement in the corporate world here in Calgary because of doing art sales and commissions. Uh, and she's now using that, those skills, those competencies, to plug highly skilled uh, immigrants, uh, new Canadians, into highly skilled technical jobs within uh, oil and gas and other, and other sectors here in Calgary. Now, if you looked at her academic credentials, and you looked at her work history, there's no way in hell you would have hired her to do the work she's doing now. She's actually very successful at it. Um, so the idea of where you look for competency, part of it is identifying what those transferable competencies are. Uh, our resumes uh, tend to be focused on job positions and job titles as opposed to outcomes and the skills that we use to get them. So I said, nobody is their job description, no one is whatever they did before. We put people in boxes uh, on org charts and yet nobody is their job description. Everybody comes to work with skills and talents that nobody knows about. And the credentials that they do have are often meaningless anyway. I'll tell you another story and then I'll move on. Uh, anybody ever heard of Max Dupree? Wrote a book called Leadership is an Art. Uh, Max and his brother uh, were, they used to run a uh, big furniture, high-end furniture company out of the States called Herman Miller. You may have heard of Herman Miller. How many can afford a chair from Herman Miller? Not me either. Um, Anyway, he tells a story in Leadership as an Art about going to the funeral of an employee, a millwright, in, in the factory. Um, and going to the reception afterwards uh, and talking with this man's widow, who, I mean, he had seen him around the plant. He knew that he was, you know, some guy wearing coveralls and carrying a wrench, right? He fixed machines. Turns out, in his spare time, he had written and published volumes of really, really, really beautiful poetry, which is not exactly the sort of skill set that you expect a millwright to have. 
And the lights came on, and, and uh, Dupree realized that he had all kinds of people wandering around his organization with skills, latent skills, that he had no idea about. And so they've made a conscious effort from that point on to try and figure out what all these latent skills were, try and figure out the whole of someone's competency and allow them to use it in their work. Creating a, an environment where they could stretch themselves, where they could do and use all of their skill sets, increase the engagement, increase their job satisfaction, and incre increase the, uh, the value for themselves and for the organization. And yet we put people in boxes. Okay. Not sure if that means it's broken. No, it's not. It's not broken. Um, so this, uh, that story from Dupree, that's from 30 or 40 years ago. And he's talking about this idea of modular credentialing. That's supposed to be blank. No, it's good. It's blank on purpose. That's so they look at me. Uh, you know, and, and, and so he started down that road 30, 40 years ago at a, as a, at a managerial level to think about this idea of modular, stackable, transferable uh, competency and understanding the whole of the skill set that individuals have and bringing them to the table. When you think about that, and this kind of gets into the whole idea of transferability skills, if you're serving clients where this idea of transferring from realm to realm and from uh, industry to industry is important. This is, this is critical. And uh, there we go. That's what I was looking for. We don't have, as I said, the, uh, uh, the model uh, for Canada. We do have this nine-tier model that come from the, comes from the DOL. Department of Labor in the US. You can find this on their Competency Clearinghouse website. You can also find it on a, uh, a thing called ONET, Occupationals Network Online, which you may or may not be familiar with. Um, but they talk about personal effectiveness, academic, workplace competencies, industry specific, occupation specific. The interesting thing is, as we look at occupations, as we drill into underlying competencies, we find out that there's almost nothing, even in this occupation specific thing bit at the top that's unique to any given job. The experiment I did yesterday in Ottawa proved it to me because they had people from widely different backgrounds, yet the critical skills that they needed to be successful had nothing to do with their technical skills and nothing to do with the industries they worked in. So if you deal with people and you're trying to fit them into boxes, the, uh, the boxes need to be built around the idea of modular competency and outcomes of the work that they do and the underlying skills which are from anywhere within this nine-tier model and not specifically related to job titles, occupational titles, or occupational descriptions. That's a paradigm shift for the, uh, for the career management industry. It's a paradigm shift for HR in the, in the corporate world. It's a paradigm shift for uh, a lot of management in, uh, in the world. But it's the only way to create this notion of a flexible, mobile, and adaptable workforce. We don't need that one because I just showed you the big one. Okay. It's going to make, yeah, there we go. <laughs> Got to fix that. So what are the outcomes of all this? If you can build this up and, and, uh, and, and start looking at the uh, underlying competencies and the outcomes of the work that you do uh, and the skills that are necessary in order to do that, you wind up with employees who have an incredible amount of career flexibility. Um, this system that I, or, or uh, understanding that I'm talking about will lead to formal recognition for informal learning. You can't have a, uh, competent, a national competency framework without 
recognition for lifelong learning and skills and things acquired uh, throughout your, your working life. As Dupree found out, looking at these whole life underlying competencies gave more meaning to the work that people did and people self-select into, uh, into things that, that have meaning for them. You get whole person engagement. From an organizational perspective, what you wind up with is an improved bottom line, doing more with less. I'm convinced that a lot of organizations, whether they're in the for-profit, non-profit, or public sector, could do twice as much work if they knew about all the latent skill that's wandering around inside the building, instead of hiring out, finding more people, or contracting it out. Ultimately, uh, this notion of transferable whole person competency uh, and self-organization around competencies to solve problems is the future of organizational life. The org chart paradigm that we have now is broken. Um, if it ever worked, uh, it certainly hasn't worked in this post-industrial world. And we need to move in this different direction. Oops, I keep hitting the wrong button. So, I'm going to wrap up. Competencies and an understanding of these meta-competencies, in addition to technical skills, are the currency that buys you performance. They're the critical pieces of the pie. They're the things we don't actually measure, and yet they're what distinguishes uh, the best uh, of, our, uh, of, our, of our personnel. Focusing on competency internally within your own organizations and externally with your, through, your, through your clients, uh, that's, the, I think, the critical, I, I talked about the secret sauce, but that's the one critical organizational skill set that you need. No one is their job description. Stop putting people in boxes. Uh, and to move in that direction, I mean, I, if, if I knew how to do that, I wouldn't be standing here. I'd be, I'd have already sold that knowledge to somebody and I'd be on some South Sea Island counting my money. It's a concerted effort on a lot of different fronts from government, from the, uh, uh, from the education sector. We need to change the way we train executives and, and leaders, which means changing the post-secondary system, which means changing the focus of business schools from a uh, financial and bottom line perspective and a top-down hierarchical structure to a, a focus on uh, harnessing and, uh, and, and liberating talent. But it's absolutely critical for the post-industrial future. Uh, and we're already in that future now. We're falling behind as a nation and we need to get our I was going to say something else, but we're on tape. We, <laughs> we, need, we need to really, uh, really focus on this stuff. Think beyond the job title. Think beyond the academic qualifications. Because as Dupree found, the poet that you need might be wandering around wearing greasy coveralls and carrying a spanner. And that's it. Thank, Thank you. you. So, questions for Jeff. And I just want to put a little bit of additional hot sauce to what Jeff just said. If you're a news junkie like I am, you will have followed all of last week what has been going on in Switzerland at the World Economic Forum. And uh, Prime Minister Trudeau going and basically positioning Canada as being a multitude of skills and competencies and abilities. What struck me and uh, to what Jeff was just saying from a very high level around competencies is what the World Economic Forum is calling the fourth industrial revolution. So it's bad enough that we can't even keep up with the Industrial Revolution, 
and we're still, you know, trying to catch up uh, with what happened in the 18th century, 19th century, but we're already in the fourth industrial revolution. So let me give you a specific example of what that means and think about it from the lens of what Jeff just talked about. How many in the room have heard of 3D printers? Okay. What about the skills that that requires? What about the competencies that that requires? And what about all of the competencies and all of the skills of the normal printer that are going bye-bye? So I'm talking to a friend of mine, and she was going for a root canal and to have an implant. And jokingly, I said to her, well, why are you doing, because she was complaining that the lab was behind and had to wait for the implant, whatever. And I said, well, why don't you talk to your teenage son and give him for his birthday a 3D printer? You'll never wait for a lab again. But it's true. So you know what? We've got to get our, and, and, and you can tell I'm passionate about this. We have to get our head out of the sand. Because Jeff has been very polite in saying nicely, we're behind the A-ball. We're so far behind the A-ball that I don't know if we can catch up. So if we do nothing today but spur us to think differently, let's do that together because together we can make it happen. Jeff said something else about the strength of the not-for-profit sector. Does anybody in the room, with Pam's exception, you're not allowed to answer, does anybody know the size of the not-for-profit sector in Canada? 8.1 billion dollars direct contribution to our national GDP. It's more than the retail sector. It is close to the combined contribution of electrical, oil and gas, and I believe mining. Statistics are widely available. So you know, you know what? It's time for us to stand up and to begin to say we are strong. Because if we all decided to go to the sunny beaches with Jeff tomorrow, there's $8.1 billion wiped out of the national economy. So just a perspective, okay? Uh, this is critical. So questions for Jeff. I know it's high-level setting. I know I've now hopefully scared everybody into go rushing off and buying 3D printers because it will save you a lot of money in the long run, let's face it. We won't need to buy light bulbs anymore. We'll just make them. Uh, any questions at a high level? Because I know there's going to be more afterwards. Question, and if you don't mind... I understand what you're saying about looking at our staff and their different skill set. My only concern is how far do we let them go with that? Because I'd be concerned that all of a sudden now they're doing something totally not with what we're, we've hired them for. Like I, I get we need to look at the bigger picture, but that would be my biggest concern. Jeff, you want to answer that at a high level? Because we'll go specific with Dirk and with Janet. Yeah, and I don't want to uh, I, I don't want to steal the thunder because I'm just the warm up act. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, there's still a need for directing that effort, uh, and I mean that's why we have management. Um, my uh, my sense is that we're moving away from the sort of uh, hierarchical organizations that we've all come to know and love. And uh, the free agent economy is uh, such that people self-select into, into the roles and positions that they want to do. The organization exists to solve a particular problem. 
and um, it, the people that uh, that come to the organization still need to be focused on mission. But it's allowing them to use skills and talents that may not be part of their job description while they solve the problem is, I think, the the, the critical piece. And um, and we see that with multidisciplinary teams in 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 industries. Um, and the uh, and the need for broad talent bases in order to solve problems, particularly problems that uh, are are particularly intractable. Everybody who's within an organization still needs to be committed to mission. And the key role of management and leadership is to establish and uh, that vision and that mission, and get a rally everybody around it, and then allow them to use the talents that they have and grow new talents in order to most effectively. Uh, uh, address that. So, you know, it's, I, I'm not suggesting a free-for-all. <laughs> um, um, anarchy is, a, it, it, it's, uh, it, is, is not particularly productive, but we need to change our mindset, and, and, uh, and I'm, uh, I'm so, what's the right word? I get really pissed off when I hear people in industries or in, and to say, I am just a fill in the blank. And no one is just a anything. And it, their organizations are doing them a disservice and they're doing the organization a disservice by making people feel they're just a whatever. Um, there's so much latent skill that we should and could be using and need to be using if we're going to be uh, successful organizationally. Thanks, Jeff. So just a thought, because now you're going to hear some very specific points. Uh, not just staff. Think about your volunteer base. Mm -hmm. Strategic volunteer engagement is going to become critical in the not-for-profit sector, including from a funder's perspective. So. Everything that we're talking so far, think about it. What about my volunteer base? How many in the room use volunteers? It's pretty much everybody. How many in the room know the competencies of your volunteers? Okay. Let's really think about it that way because that is how you maximize your outcomes. Any questions from the floor? I know that this is a complex topic, uh, and thanks, Janet, for going granular on this, but uh, don't waste the opportunity to ask anything that you want out of the panel. I happen to have a slightly different opinion uh, when Janet talks about when the oil and gas is going to come back. Uh, and I don't want to be the naysayer in the room, but uh, I really don't think it's going to the way it was. No. I really don't. Uh, and for one reason, first of all, the world is changing. Number two, the political will has changed. And we cannot simply think that, oh, okay, you know, in two months, three months, we're going to be back to the heydays. It's just not going to but happen. But you know what, Nicole? We don't, and you know what? We won't have to because what's happening in the, uh, the sector is that the, the industries have become so efficient. They have become so efficient that they can operate on $60 a barrel. Well... And that is where the transferability of skills right. and higher efficiency in the skill set and the competency is gonna, it's going to come in. Uh, to Janet's point about the questions on the slide preceding this one, if you go to the website of the talent pool on the homepage, you're going to see a study that we released about two months ago with a colleague partner organization where we did an analysis of transferability of skills between, uh, from the oil uh, and gas sector to the supply chain. And you're welcome to look at it. 
and you can see that, yes, it can happen. So uh, the more we learn about this very difficult art and craft that we talked about today, uh, the better off we'll be. Questions for Jeff, Dirk, Janet? No? Yes, there's a question coming there. I'm not sure who it's from. That's OK. I'm not sure who it would uh, best suit, but would you have any suggestions on um, uh, methods on identifying the competencies? Like, I'm thinking more like, you, can you recommend any questionnaires? Or uh, there are consultants that do testing, um, programs that test for different behaviors and competencies. I've, I've done some of those in recruiting. Um, are there methods and practices that you could relate to competencies on that front? Is that a, that's a pretty yeah, broad no, question? That's fair. That's you a want, fair question. Do, do you want the short answer or the long answer? <laughs> um, one of the best resources when you're, uh, when you're looking at your organization and, and doing this organizationally um, is uh, the Competency Clearinghouse, Career One Stop. Um, we'll get you the, the, the links. But uh, the U.S. Department of Labor uh, has spent a hockey sock full of money over the last 10 years working on this and talking about these uh, modular stackable credentials and how they apply across multiple industries and multiple uh, uh, contexts. So uh, as, a, as a starting point, that's, that's where I, I would start because they may actually have on that Career One Stop page a competency framework for the position or the occupational title that you're looking for, and then you can take that and modify from it. But that'll give you at least a place to start. Um, there's, I mean, there's any number of, of other resources that you can use, but that's one of the better ones. Okay. Can I just Thank add you. to that too? Yes. Um, just on more of a strategic level, um, part of what we're doing now with organizations is we're doing, and you can either do this at an organizational level or at a departmental level, and actually that's going to be part of the work that you do on that bringing it all together mm -hmm. workshop, is to do the SWOT analysis. And so part of your SWOT analysis, there's specific questions that you can ask that will actually drive out those competencies. So there are methodologies available and there are simple templates. Uh, we're going to probably do a follow-up to the session just because it is so broad and there is so much involved. But right now, I know that Jackie needs to share a couple of things that are of interest to all of you. And I want to remind everybody, we need your feedback survey questions. Please leave them on the table. Thanks to you, we have enough now for HR in a box two and three. So uh, you're driving this bus.